Welcome back to the Texas News Podcast, where we dive into all things Texas politics and the future of independence in the state of Texas. On today's show, we're going to talk about my recent appearance on Dr. Phil Primetime. Going to talk about how much was edited and left on the cutting room floor. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the panel dynamics. Going to critique the lack of solutions from some of the other guests. And I'm going to directly respond to Dr. Phil's closing remarks and his assertion that my comments were reckless. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> Well, it is great to be back with you for another episode of the Texas News Podcast. Uh, I have been away for a bit, but as you can see, uh, I've been uh, quite busy. I mean, look, it's not like we haven't been uh, in the media talking about Texas uh, all over the place. I, I think last tally we had since January, we've been in the media, uh, articles written about us. I think there were like 150, somewhere in that ballpark. I mean, it's... It's getting up there. Too much for us to keep track of. But, of course, with all of that media coverage that's happening with Newsweek and Daily Mail and all of those things, the big daddy of big daddies happened this last Monday. Uh, in fact, uh, many of you probably have already seen the segment. Uh, I was a guest uh, on a panel on Dr. Phil Primetime. And uh, we we actually recorded it, uh, I don't know, uh, a couple of months ago, somewhere around there. Uh, but it actually aired this last Monday. And uh, I can tell you, uh, a lot of you have watched it. You've reached out. Uh, you, you said, look, I, I know something is happening here. Uh, what's going on? Now, of course, generally, everyone's been pretty doggone excited uh, about the fact that we got a chance to talk about Texit on uh, a, a pretty big show. I mean, with a with a broad, broad reach. Now, um, you know that's that's something, and and I, we'll talk about that here in a moment. But really and truly, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, excitement about us being on there, but uh, a lot of criticism about how the entire episode was handled. So uh, I'm gonna tuck into it uh, in this episode because I want to I want to talk about some of the things and address some of the concerns that, that many of you have had out there. Of course, not concerns for us. You know, you you are concerned about how we were treated, and, and I think how uh, at least you perceived we were treated, and maybe after the editing was over, how we were actually treated. Uh, but I'm going to give you some behind the scenes, right? I'm going to talk about my experience there and talk about exactly uh, what what was missing and really and truly where it goes from here. So uh, let's just get down to the brass tacks. The number one comment that uh, I have received in feedback was everyone noticed. Now, I say the number one, right? The number one has been overwhelmingly positive. Everyone has expressed their excitement that we were actually being covered on this particular broadcast. And like I said, I'll get to why that's important here in a bit and how this maybe differentiates itself from some of the other coverage we've gotten. But uh, other than the positive stuff, right, I, I want to start with the number one concern. And, and the number one concern has been how much was actually edited, right? Um, a lot of times with these TV programs uh, pre-recorded, and, and look, this is not the first one that I've done. Uh, I, I understand what happens in between the time that you record a, a TV program and by the time it makes it makes air. Uh, but it was pretty evident to a lot of folks that gave us feedback that there must have been some things uh, left on the cutting room floor. And, and indeed there was. Uh, the number one, I'm not going to say criticism, because uh, it's not a criticism directed toward us, but it, I think a lot of people right off the top noticed that there was a lot of choppy editing. Uh, and, and I got to tell you, I mean, it was evident when when I watched it back, uh, it was definite that there was really some, I, I'm not going to say sloppy, but I mean, it was very evident, you know, where uh, you know, for example, I, I was talking about the historical context of self-determination and 
all of that, and you know, and, and they're just some of the stuff. The, the chops were happening kind of in the middle of sentences, and and it was really getting kind of truncated down. Now, before anyone starts firing off hate mail to uh, Merritt Street and Dr. Phil, I'm going to tell you right now that everyone uh, that uh, was connected with the show uh, and the recording were absolutely stellar. I mean, we had, uh, you know, just the absolute red carpet treatment. They they were amazing, uh, and, and including Dr. Phil. No, we'll we'll talk about that here here in a bit as well. Um, but you know there there has been some some criticism of of that editing job and and people looking at that, watching that episode, and going, "Look, I, I, it's obvious there was more here." Uh, and yeah, you know, it, it, there was. I mean, there was. You have to understand though, we were effectively on a panel. Uh, and, and by the way, we'll make sure to include a link to the entire, uh, to the, obviously not the unedited version, but the air version. We'll make sure, for those of you who haven't seen it, there's actually a link on the TNM website, but we'll make sure to include it um, in, uh, in the description for this, this podcast. But that being said, it was a panel. You know, it was, uh, you know, obviously Dr. Phil was, was moderating and hosting, uh, but you had uh, Dan Golvach, who some of you may know Dan, uh, if you don't, uh, let me just give you a refresher. Uh, in fact, here's his testimony that he gave uh, when House Bill 1359 was filed back two sessions ago, the Texas Independence Referendum Act. Here's the virtual testimony that he gave. My name is Dan Golbach. Uh I'm a native Texan, uh, 58 years. Uh, I'm a professional musician and a teacher. And uh, January 31st of 2015, my then 25-year-old son, Spencer Goldbach, had his brains blown out by a four-time deported illegal alien that had a nasty 15-year rap sheet and had done five years in prison uh, for attempted murder. This was just a random act at a red light. He went on to take out uh, two more Americans that night uh, before he was stopped. Since then, I've been active in politics and I've been to DC. I've met with the president and I've come to the conclusion that really there is absolutely no hope whatsoever of the uh, cesspool of bribery, blackmail, and direct intimidation in DC uh, to ever fix this problem and protect our citizens here in Texas. And I am am firmly of the opinion that uh, the only way that we're going to ever be able to not only protect our safety, but to protect our uh, inalienable rights and uh, freedom and liberty is by becoming an independent state and doing the job that the federal government won't do ourselves. That's the only way it's going to happen. And for this reason, I am voicing my support for HB 1359. And I urge other Texans that want to maintain our way of life and uh, live freely and uh, not have to worry about their children getting their brains blown out at a street corner less than a mile from their home. I urge them to consider this and to contact their state rep and let them know that you support, again, HB 1359. Uh, Texans are the only real protection for Texans. It's not going to come from Washington, D.C., sadly to say, but that's just where it is, and I am a, a, a staunch supporter of Texas independence, and I think the time is now to move. Okay, so the, the episode kicked off with Dan, uh, which then segued into me, and I had a segment, and then they brought Carla Garrick on, who Carla is, you guys know, we interviewed her on a previous podcast. She is uh, formerly the head, or maybe still, of the Free State Project, but she is heading up nhexitnow.org, uh, and she did a phenomenal job. Uh, and then they brought out a couple of detractors, and like I said, I'll, I'll get to them in a bit too. But, you know, when you have five people on a panel like that, you, you don't have a lot of time to really dive off into all of the particular issues. And so, uh, granted, you know, a lot of the things that were being talked about um, – were really chopped down. And when you get to that segment, I know a lot of you out there are used to hearing me kind of unpack these things. These are not 
simple issues that that allow for you know three to five word answers, right? You ask a question and you got to unpack it, right? This is this is complex, and I think that a lot of folks out there look at this issue and and they want super simple answers to very complex issues, you know, to very complex challenges or issues. And when you reduce it down to the simple, it doesn't satisfy them, right? They because they they really want a they they want an answer, but they don't want it in the way that it has to be given to actually answer. And I'm hope I hope I'm making sense on that. But anyway, look, um, you know, it's evident there was just a, a ton of, of editing, and and I want to acknowledge that for everyone. You know, obviously, we didn't have a say in the matter, and I, I can tell you that they did have to chop a good bit to get it down into that format to last an hour. Guys, that's the breaks. Uh, if we're going to move forward and, and we sit in on these panels like this, um, that's just what happens. So I don't want people to get too bent out of shape about the editing issue. Just understand that it happened. And, uh, you know, there was not a lot of time to unpack some of those issues. So don't don't sweat it too badly. Um, but it really, I think, from our perspective, uh, it is, it's not harmful. I think it, it really and truly is, is, doesn't do the issue justice. To, to chop it like that, you know, when you've got to uh, address those issues. You know, for example, I mean, there were there were several critical points that were cut from the broadcast. Um, we talked uh, a good bit about the economic viability. You actually could find some, some hints of that conversation in there where we talked about Texas having the eighth largest economy in the world, uh, talking about the diversity of our economy. Uh, you know, uh, I think it even, my line about, uh, if Texas can't make it as an independent nation, then who can? Um, you know that was there, but some of the some of the uh, discussion around that did not make the final cut. Now, although I was very clear that we are pursuing a peaceful constitutional political process for achieving independence, um, what I said didn't make it. However, uh, Phil did us a solid, and uh, if you watch the broadcast, you will hear Doctor Phil. Because let me just back up a bit. The episode is is framed almost in, in terms of this idea of civil war. In fact, the discussion of the the journalist and the academic after uh, Dan and myself and Carla, that's really kind of what they they keyed in on. And in fact, the teaser for the episode talks about uh, civil war. And so Phil actually came back and and reiterated the issue. He, he reiterated our position, which is. This is a peaceful political process, right? This is what we are doing. We are moving through a lawful process to achieve independence. And so, um, you know, kudos on that one uh, because I was very, I was kind of nervous when that did not initially come across at the part where it was supposed to. But I think maybe Phil, in anticipation of how the edit would go, uh, actually covered it for us. So that was. That was really nice, right? And and I appreciate that. But it was important because it needed to counter the narrative that the issue of secession or withdrawing from the union is inherently violent or chaotic. Uh, it's just uh, it just doesn't have to be. And those people that talk about that, or you know, like this never-ending drumbeat of civil war, or if you guys leave, we're gonna you know the federal government's gonna bomb the hell out of you. You know th- those sorts of things are just utterly ridiculous, right? But these points are vital for understanding that Texas is not just a reactionary movement to the outrage of the day, but a well-considered strategy for Texas' future, right? This is not about the outrage of the day. Uh, If it was, then you would see the issue of Texas rise and fall and polling uh, with every different outrage. It would like a lot of these issues, it would run hot and then it would run cold and then it would run hot and then it would run cold. It, that's not been our trajectory at all. Uh, our trajectory has been steady and smooth, all growing support moving toward independence, or at least a vote on independence where we will win. So uh, I have to say this, um, you know, as we, as we move along uh, talking about what else happened, um, 
I know I've already talked about Dan and Carla um, and, and played you a clip of Dan's um, testimony. But le- let me just go ahead and say that the panel was actually stacked in our favor, right? And although on the show, Phil did not come across as pro Texit or even open to Texit, um, what what you essentially had was out of a panel of five guests, you had three of them that were strongly in favor of independence, right? And so you had Dan and I advocating for Texit. You had Carla advocating for New Hampshire exit and Texit. Uh, and then you had the journalist and you had the uh, the author. And so, uh, you know, the, the dynamics of, of the panel were definitely in our favor. And so, you know, while some people may lament that due to editing, we didn't get a lot of time, understand that collectively we were able to uh, effectively dominate the episode. Uh, to the point that uh, you know it was it was pretty doggone evident. I mean it it's it's no wonder that Phil had to kind of step in at some point to to balance it out a little bit. Uh, it's just it, it's amazing. But you know you you look at the the way that the episode was constructed, right? Dan Goldvach, um, you know you you just you heard his testimony a moment ago. I mean that's how the that's how the episode led off. With, with Dan's story and understanding that there is a real human cost for what's happening with Washington, D.C. And then Carla, you know, after, after they brought me on, they brought Carla on, and she was able to, to lend a perspective. <clears throat> excuse me. She was able to lend a perspective from New Hampshire. Now, you guys, look, we've talked about New Hampshire and New Hampshire independence, but New Hampshire independence got introduced to a whole new audience, right? It, it was kind of a counterbalance. I mean, the only way that it could have gotten any more interesting is if they had added uh, Marcus Ruiz Evans from Cal Exit, right, and, and had a, a, a left perspective and a right perspective and a sort of libertarian perspective from New Hampshire, or had the Alaskan Independence Party representatives, or you know the folks from uh, Free Louisiana, or you know any of these other movements. Um, I, I mean, it was just it was pretty amazing. But having Carla come in there, uh, like I said, if you want to see my previous interview or go listen to it, it it's available. But uh, many of you probably already know of her either through that or some other things. But but Carla just absolutely brought the heat. You know, if they thought, hey, look, here's Dan Goldvach and. You know his his story is is really terrible, you know, and it's very it's very sad. But I just don't know if that justifies Texas leaving the union. That they drag out me, who's going in there and and saying, look, uh, if we can't, then who can? Uh, you know, if if that didn't do it, here comes Carla from New Hampshire in their minds out of left field and just knocking them straight in the jaw, right? Talking about local governance and talking about independence and and you know it, it just. It just played well. So, uh, again, I, I want you guys to understand that the panel was set up for success. Uh, our viewpoint was able to dominate that discussion uh, in a major, major, major way. So after us, I mentioned that they brought out a journalist and an author. And, and again, if you haven't seen this, I'm not spoiling anything. Uh, but the journalist, her name was Laura Wellington, and they actually talked uh, they told us that she was going to be on the panel um, before we taped. So I knew about that. I did not know uh, that Richard Kreitner, uh, the author, was going to be on there. Um, but it was interesting because when they talked to us about Laura Wellington being on there, uh, I went and I looked up some of her work. And what was amazing about um, Laura and and really what kind of shocked me uh, in person, uh, Laura's work as a journalist she basically is calling out and saying look we've got a dictatorship or an autocracy in washington dc the wheels are falling off the wagon all of the indicators are there that the united states is heading to a civil war but that's where she stops you know she had absolutely no interest in the idea of any state leaving the union and then you know you essentially had um you know 
you had Richard Kreitner kind of doing the same thing. You know, he just, he talked about, well, you know, we have these internal pressures and, you know, and it's polarized and things are bad. Uh, but you know, it's just, you know, states leaving the union, that's just nothing, you know, that, that just, that can't happen. It's just too impractical. And, you know, there's just dangers. And then he started with the Russia, Russia, Russia nonsense, which you should probably go back and listen to my, my, uh, podcast episode about that one. Um, but you know, what he didn't do was he didn't acknowledge that there are systemic issues within the federal government that drive movements like ours, right? Neither, neither Laura nor Richard. Uh, actually wanted to uh, address the issue, right? In other words, they would say, here's a problem, but there are no constructive steps whatsoever to avoid such a scenario. You know, and and to me, that's apocalypse porn. I, I talk about it in the Texit book. These are people that are predicting doom and gloom. They They see it. They see the path, but they don't provide any way out of there, at least none that makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, and, and we'll get to talking about that here in a moment when I talk about Dr. Phil's closing, because that is probably the second uh, most commented aspect of the interview that I've received. But, you know, it's it's interesting because I think if you're watching that episode and, and you listen to both Laura and Richard, which, by the way, again, fabulous people. I, I enjoyed visiting with them after the show was over. We got a little bit of time to visit. But in, in visiting with them, uh, super nice people. But the problem is, is that they don't really posit any solutions. And, and guys, if we want, if we want to talk about the problems, guess what? You got, you got hump, uh, umpteen million channels that talk about the, uh, you know, of news that talk about the problem. All I got to do is flip on Fox News, CNN, or really any of them. You know, and I can see the problem. I can walk out of my house. I can go to the gas station and see the problem. I can go to the grocery store and see the problem. I can talk to my neighbor and see the problem. I don't need a journalist or a, a, a you know, an author or the news media or any of these things to tell me there's a problem, right? Maybe they can shed some some light on, you know, some some statistics or some data or something like that. But we all know that there's a problem. And so, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that constructive dialogue requires both identifying problems and proposing viable solutions, which was entirely lacking. If, if indeed they were meant to be the counter to us, understand that nothing that was said on the other side of the table invalidated anything we said in our case for making Texas independent you know, or New Hampshire or any other state. In fact, we were the only ones that were uh, on that on that broadcast that presented any viable solution whatsoever, okay? Which really brings me to uh, kind of the, the tail end, which was uh, at the end of the at the end of all of his episodes, Dr. Field does a closing monologue. And I'm just going to distill it down for you. I can't, you know, due to copyright or whatever, I can't play the whole thing for you. But when you go watch the episode, you'll see it. And as much as I appreciate what Dr. Field did in inviting us on his show uh, and enjoyed in the breaks him talking about the Texit book and asking questions about it, talking about how much he liked it, as much as I appreciate that, I want you to understand that nothing, nothing illustrates the reality that that independence, state independence, if you want to talk about Texit or New Hampshire exit or CalEx or any any of those, nothing illustrates the point that that is our only way forward to avoid this calamity than watching Dr. Phil's closing monologue. Because while he publicly came out and, and essentially condemned what we're talking about, talking about, no, it's going to be too difficult. You'll have problems and it doesn't solve anything. Yeah. He gave no real proof, but more than that, his solution was uh, effectively for 400 million Americans to wake up tomorrow morning and observe the golden rule, right? He, he suggested that 400 million Americans could set aside their differences and work together harmoniously overnight. 
And I got to tell you, this idea is not only unrealistic, perhaps delusional, but it's also very, very dangerous. You see, when you have such a deep-seated sickness, this, this, this pressure internally, these competing worldviews, these deep-seated issues, and you ignore them, it is a recipe for disaster. One of two things happens. It either blows up or it invites an autocratic reign from some tyrannical government to keep its hand on those, those competing realities. That's the danger in thinking that one day everyone's going to wake up and we're going to link pinkies and sing Kumbaya. It's just not the reality. The reality is Texans are suffering. We're suffering at the border. We're suffering at the grocery store. We're suffering at the gas pump. And yes, Texas economy is banging on all cylinders, but we are making our moves economically now that set us up for political independence. And so things are tough right now, but understand the moves are already being made that are putting Texas on the path to becoming a self-governing independent nation. You know, Texans need practical solutions that address the differences and work toward realistic and achievable goals. That is the reality of our situation. And while I appreciate uh, Dr. Phil's optimism, I do not appreciate it so much that I am willing to sacrifice my family and my children and their children on a hope, wish, or a dream. No, instead, what I'm willing to do is get out here and work on a practical solution that achieves the vision of an independent, self-governing nation of Texas that becomes free of that morass in Washington, D.C., that becomes free of the 2.5 million unelected federal bureaucrats that put their thumbs on us every single solitary day. That's the reality. That is the reality that, uh, that we face. That is the path that we are on. And while all of these people think about these solutions, they, they have essentially no hope, right? I mean, when you paint some sort of pipe dream like we're going to wake up tomorrow and all be, you know, in an old Coca-Cola commercial trying to teach the world to sing, right? While, while they're doing that and, and behaving that way, the reality is... They're out of solutions because their world cannot, in their minds, all of their solutions have to be done within the context of preserving the union. And essentially what they have done is they have established preserving the union as their highest value and are willing to sacrifice every other, like freedom and liberty and all of these other things. So they've prioritized preserving the union over preserving liberty. And there, my friends is indeed the rub between the people of Texas and the people of some of these other states. So last thing uh, on this particular episode is, <laughs> and really uh, the, the final thing that, that I've gotten kind of from the comments was when um, I made a comment, and you many of you have probably heard me make it before, uh, Richard Kreitner made some kind of statement about military action from the federal government, and, and you guys have heard me say this before, uh, some of you. And, and I say it to paint a picture of how, rid how ridiculous the scenario is, but also how much trouble we're in. Because, you know, what, what I say is, look, if, if, you know, when Texans go to vote on this and, and the federal government's response is to go bomb Walmart in Houston, uh, then what does that say about the federal government and where we think they are right now, right? If, if they're willing to go kill people because in their minds they voted wrong, right? That's stuff that you would see out of a dictatorship in North Korea or Syria or Iran or one of these other places, right? And so... You know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that I think that maybe it felt like I was pummeling on Kreitner a bit, but Dr. Phil came back and said that that statement was reckless. And, and indeed, I didn't find it reckless at all. Uh, it's just, you know, let's just be honest about this thing. 
you know, I, I can't see where it is reckless other than the fact that it may be encouraging people to rethink their relationship and, and how they view the federal government. Um, you know, we already, I think most of us have a pretty sour taste in our mouth from the federal government, but understand that when someone fear mongers using the threat of federal force to come kill you because you support your state becoming independent, then again, that, I mean, the reality is that is a position that you would expect from some autocratic regime overseas somewhere. I mean, the, the United States sent troops to go engage in regime change when regimes do that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I, the doc may think that that was a reckless comment, but I think the reckless, the recklessness comes from people who so uh, nonchalantly want to use the threat of uh, military force on the from the federal government on a people who peacefully and lawfully go to the polls and vote, I think that is the problem. I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, this is the Texas News podcast, but let's look at the news. All of these condemnations from people who, uh, you know, a year ago were condemning Texas because we want to vote for Texas independence are condemning Maduro in Venezuela because he cheated and stole an election. And they said, we're not going to recognize his his election steal, right? We're not going to do that. Uh, in fact, we're going to recognize the other guy because the voice of the people should never be stifled. Wow, right? I mean, these people, maybe not, maybe they don't see their own hypocrisy, but it is. it should be for any Texan advocate who has been at this for any length of time whatsoever, it should be glaringly obvious how hypocritical some of these people are. So that being said, um, you know, I didn't find it reckless at all. In fact, I, I thought the classification of my comments as reckless was actually their reckless act. But, you know, obviously, as I said at the very beginning, because this was a panel, there were several issues that we didn't get to cover, right? We didn't really get to get, get in depth on economic viability, uh, military and defense, social services, the legal pathways and sort of the, you know, the legal precedents necessary to get there. Uh, you know, we didn't talk about public opinion and polling numbers or the referendum itself. Didn't talk about uh, international relations or infrastructure or, you know, any of the actual internal opposing uh, forces that we're fighting against. So understand that if if you are coming to this the first time through the Dr. Phil show, understand there is a much bigger discussion that has to be had over Texas independence, and we have the answers. Uh, if you haven't yet visited TexitNow.org to go get those answers, now is the time. If you haven't read the Texit book, Dr. Phil did, uh, if you haven't read the Texit book, go do that, right? Go go pick up a copy of it. Uh, but if you don't want to pick up a copy of it, you don't have to get it from us, right? You can go to Amazon, you can go wherever, or you can just, if you want the the questions answered, go to textitnow.org and get them, get them answered. Dr. Phil's a good segue for a lot of people. He's going to be a gateway for a lot of people to come to this particular issue here in Texas uh, and, and really begin to learn about it in earnest. And this brings me to the, really, I think, the, the final analysis over the Dr. Phil issue, right? The Dr. Phil episode. Guys, you got to understand what this what this does, right? Understand that it doesn't, not every time we're in the media does it have to be a pro at puff piece, right? It doesn't even have to be fair and balanced. I mean, let, let's be honest. I've been at this since 1996. Uh, I can count maybe on both hands the number of times we've been covered fairly and equally in the media, okay? But understand that just by having this episode, and by having Dan and having Carla and having me and having uh, Laura and Richard uh, and and even talking about this on his platform on his on his show, um, Doctor Phil has uh, essentially taken this to the next level, right? So maybe he's not on board yet, but the fact that he was willing to present this to his audience, which is substantial. Uh, highlights that we are moving into that phase where discussion about this has become mainstream. Look, we know the polling says that we're well over a majority. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt with all of the media coverage that we're getting as of late, this is uh this has become a mainstream issue. 
National divorce crops up uh, almost every single day on social media uh, in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, the the fact that we're entering into the next legislative session with more legislators than ever advocating or helping us advocate for a vote on Texas independence, uh, you know, moving, uh, you know, the, the heaven and earth to preserve these two planks in the Republican Party platform to see that the Libertarian Party of Texas has formed their own Texas caucus. Guys, this is it. You know, everything has been built up, and now we are getting very close to the end of this. Uh, but this is not where you stop, right? You, you don't let this thing run on its own because the opposition's still pushing, right? They're still going to do everything they can to stop it. So we have to push a lot harder and a lot faster and a lot further. We're almost there. We're almost there. But, you know, really just to kind of sum up, uh, my appearance on Dr. Phil highlighted, I think, the growing support for Texas. Uh, the need for us to start having balanced discussions uh, on this issue and the importance of presenting Texas as a practical solution to all of these problems that we're facing. Right? We know that the TNM, the Texas Nationalist Movement, is committed to a peaceful constitutional path to independence, and we are absolutely closer than ever to achieving this goal. But your support and engagement are crucial. So as we wrap up, uh, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna encourage you. Look, I want you to visit our website. Uh, head over to tnm.me and become a member if you haven't done so already. And you can stay up to date on all of the latest information, all the latest news. And uh, if you missed the appearance, as I mentioned at the very beginning, if you missed the appearance on Doctor Phil Prime Time, uh, you can actually go to meritplus.com and watch the full episode. Uh, we have a link to it on the news section of our website. So go check that out. Well, uh, look, uh, I got to tell you, it's been great to be back with the Texas News Podcast. We were on hiatus for a while, but we are definitely back and uh, just absolutely, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to be together with you. And uh, we got a lot of phenomenal episodes coming up, a lot of things planned, including we're, uh, the return of late night coffee talk on the second and fourth Wednesdays of every month. Again, the information will be on the calendar. And uh, the launch of a brand new podcast that's going to be exclusively for members of the TNM called the Texit Insider. Uh, it's going to be a little more freewheeling than this, but uh, anyway, I think you'll enjoy it. So, look, I want to thank you again for tuning in, and uh, I'm going to leave you with the words that I leave you with every time we're together. Uh, they're the words of Sam Houston when he said that Texas will again lift its head and stand among the nations. I believe that time is now, and the question is, will you stand with her? See you next time, folks. Yeah.